Hello, it's Dr. Fred, and welcome to another amazing episode of The Healthy Healer. And today I have a guest from down under, from Australia, from Queensland, and his name is Simon Rinney. And as you heard in the introduction, Simon is uh, someone that I really expect to have a beautiful conversation with today. And basically what we're here to discuss is his path to being a healer. It's a unique path that Simon has taken. Um, he was able to answer a questionnaire before. This is the first time we're actually meeting. But in order to apply to be here, he answered a questionnaire, and I was immediately enchanted with his answers and who he has become and how he got here. So we're going to find out a little bit about a pathway to becoming a healthy healer. Simon is clearly one who has followed a pathway in that direction. And I think at this point is really making a big difference with um other men who have issues that are uh, that are that resonate with his own issues. I think that's what I understand from his answers. So, Simon, first of all, welcome to the Healthy Healer. It's really an honor and pleasure to have you here with me, Dr. Fred. Really excited to be here, and thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm I'm excited to have a chat about men's mental health because that's what I'm all about. And yeah, looking forward to it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, men's mental health. And the way that we're going to get here first is get a little bit of a storyline. So first of all, it's like, I like to ask the simple question. It's a nine letter question. There's only nine letters in the entire question. And the question is, Simon Rennie, who are you? <laughs> You're going straight deep and beautiful straight away. This is one of the hardest questions I ever, I ever know how to answer. And I don't really know how to answer. So I'm just going to go from where my heart yeah. is at the moment. And who am I? I... I'm someone who is deeply passionate about the lived experience of mental illness. Someone who from walking the path myself knows exactly what it's like to feel down and out and like there is no light at the end of the tunnel, but also as a healthy healer, someone who's done the work and has recognized that there's, there's things that we can do as men particularly to change and then use that pain, I guess, that I have gone through over over three decades as fuel for my passion for men's mental health and turn that into a something that I don't have to hide from anymore and I can use it to support other guys to essentially do the same and open up about what's going on inside. So it's someone who's deeply passionate about this stuff. But on the surface level, it's also someone who's a husband and a father. I've got two little ones, um, someone who really just has a, a really good sense at the moment of living an authentic life. And this comes from burning out as well in 2020, taking off that mask and knowing now what it's like to just show it all and not hide anything anymore. So it's, this is, these are things that I'm really passionate about. And I'm, and I'm hoping, I'm, I probably haven't done the question any justice because it is such a hard question, but this is where I'm, this is where my heart is at the moment. It's someone who's just yeah really pursuing this healthy healer journey. Right. I think you've done a great job with answering the question. So you know, even though the second part might be the really the first part, you're you're an honest to goodness dedicated father and husband. And you said you have two little ones at home. Is that right? I do. I've got a six year old boy and a three year old girl. A six year old boy and a three year old girl. And you know, you've had these issues. It sounds like the issues, uh, at least uh, in 2020, came to a head. And that sounds like about the same time that your daughter was being born. So there's some crossover there about what was going on with your life in 2020. And I'm sure we'll get to that. We can go there now, or we can talk a little bit about your uh, previous history, where you declare that you were walking around with what you thought was a mental health condition or a mental illness. And you put that in your questionnaire. Can you tell us a little bit about that history from way back when? Yeah, absolutely. So I, for, to, to provide context, so I'm a social worker. So social workers love context. And, and I grew up in a place called Adelaide, South Australia. So I'm in Queensland at the moment, which is on the East coast, but I came from central Australia and, and, for, for, to paint a picture, the the area that I grew up was a lower socioeconomic area. Um, there's a lot of people that worked in manufacturing, so they had a car manufacturer there, Holden's. Um, there was a lot of people working in trades. There was a lot of people who were on welfare, and so it was it was a lower socioeconomic area. And I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and so this is a period of time, particularly in Australian culture, where discussions around mental health or mental illness were pretty much non-existent. 
And if you were as a as a young boy to show emotions or to or to anything like that, you'd be quickly told to suck it up and be a man, because men boys and men don't cry and show emotions. And so this kind of shaped who I was. And and at about eight years old, I developed obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm. and this stayed undiagnosed until I was 28. So for two decades, trying to figure it out in my head, didn't have the words to express what was going on, um, didn't have somebody to, to go talk to. Yes, I live with mum and dad and, and stuff like that, but it wasn't an environment where you can say, hey, mum, dad, this is what's going through my head, and this is the kind of things that I do from an OCD perspective. In fact, mm. I didn't know what OCD was That's until right. I was diagnosed at 28. So mm. I didn't even know, I had never even heard of it before. Um, and then over that journey, depression, anxiety also came along for the ride. And I probably felt more depressed than I did OCD. But then when I have gone and, and started to understand OCD, I think the OCD was the most prevalent condition that I've lived with. And I still live with today. So I'm, I'm turning 40 next month in August. And, and it's something that doesn't go away. You just learn different coping strategies over the journey. Um, yeah, to, to manage that as best as possible. And so 2012 was the first time I went into a GP's office and I said, I think I've got a mental health condition. Still didn't really know what that meant, but you know, back then people were starting to talk about mental health and saying it's really important. And then that set me on a journey of a bit of self-discovery, trying different types of therapies, and then ultimately deciding, yep, I want to become a men's therapist and do this as a profession myself. And that's where I started Mindful Men about 12 months ago, actually, as a, as a therapy business. Um, take it a few steps back to 2020 when I burnt out. And, you know, I, I'd spent 15 years working as a public servant in different government jobs. Um, my daughter had, was newly born about, she was about eight months old at the time. I had my son. We had COVID lockdown. So COVID was going around the world. And, we, and in Australia, we had some of the longest lockdowns in the world and some of the harshest ones. And yep. Also, I was working in a high-performing job, so I had to be on go constantly. I was also studying my Master's of Social Work as a, as a part-time thing in the evenings on the weekend. So my brain never essentially had time to slow down and stop. I was bouncing from this, that, and something else, and it, it, it eventually got to a point where I hit a brick wall, both physically and mentally, emotionally, um, and had to take five months off of work to recover mm. from burnout. And it's there that I discovered mindfulness and started my mindfulness journey, which has been going for a few years now. And that's really become the foundation therapy modality in my business, Mindful Men. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, this ride. It sounds like there was 20 years where you had uh, something that you later learned was OCD from the age of eight to the age of 28. And what did you learn? Like, how did you learn that that was a condition, you know? I'm uh, I'm hesitant to give people diagnoses years after that anything starts. I'm actually hesitant to diagnose anybody with anything, uh, to be honest. I don't always know that it really provides any kind of relief for anybody or that it's actually a therapeutic intervention of any type. But for you, it sounds like receiving or learning a little bit about this, uh, this entity called obsessive compulsive disorder, you were able to find some freedom there. And now even leverage that into who you are for men who are struggling with mental health dysfunction or imbalance. Tell us a little bit more about those 20 years. What were those like? Oh, 20 years was, was tough. It was really tough. And to not be able to talk about it was probably, if I had the opportunity to talk about it, I dare say I wouldn't have gone into so much pain over those years. But, you know, it started as eight in the schoolyard. Some kids said to me, if, you know, Simon, if you stop using your voice for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. So this created this obsessive thought around losing my voice and that freaked me out. And so I started performing this compulsive humming activity every set, every minute of every day. For two years, I did this. Eventually, I grew out of that just to check that my voice was there. And then, you know, in my teens, mum and dad separated and we went with mum. My, my little brother and I had moved out with mum. And I felt this overwhelming need to be the man of the house. And these were kind of concepts that were going around back then as well. It was like, you had to have a man of the house. And so I would spend three, four, five hours a night locking up the house, compulsively checking that doors, windows, you know, curtains were drawn in a certain way that 
ovens and irons were, were turned off and not going to set a light. And I would do this all in the dark. Nobody knew I was walking around the dark as a 13, 14, 15 year old. And even I'd still do this today as a 39 year old, um, not to the excessive hours that I used to do. So then I'd wake up the next day and feel exhausted and have to go to school, but I'd be constantly checking things at school and, but doing it in a silent way. And it's not until my diagnosis happened that I learned what OCD was and did a bit of research and discovered that on average from first symptom to first treatment for OCD, it's about 15 years. And that's why they call it a silent condition. For me, I didn't actually get treated for OCD until I was about 37. So, 37. so even though I got the diagnoses, the psychologist was and subsequent psychiatrist, counsellors, all the people that I've seen over the years have always focused on the, the depression, but never the OCD. And, and in fact, it wasn't until I burnt out and I created an Instagram page to, to share my story and hope that it helps other people around burnout. But then I started sharing about my OCD and depression, anxiety and men's health in more general that I discovered an OCD community. And it was, it was just through social media that I'm like, okay, what's this? And then through that, I discovered this thing called exposure response prevention, which was you know, apparently the gold standard for OCD treatment. And I'm like, well, I've been doing this for however many decades now. I'm sick of doing all these checking behaviors. It caused so much anxiety and it causes so much perfectionism in my life, which I really struggle with. And I found a, a local provider here on the Sunshine Coast where I live and started actually treating OCD and that's and when how, what would really that what, would, what did that treatment look like so ERP falls under that that broader cognitive behavioral therapy umbrella but instead of focusing purely on thoughts it actually focuses on preventing behaviors and so what we would do an example being one of my my obsessive thoughts is when I park my car I have to have the handbrake on really tight because I worry that it's going to roll down a hill and cause mayhem, chaos everywhere, kill people. And if I get that obsessive thought, I have to go back and check the car. And I could be doing this several times. I could walk kilometers away, then have to walk back and do this checking. And so one of the things we did in, in, in my therapy was for exposure response prevention was to go into the car park with my, my psychologist and take the handbrake off and then turn around and, and walk away. And we just, we were only 10 meters away from the car, but I wasn't allowed to check the car. I had to be confident and sit with that anxiety that just peaks through that obsessive thought, let it sit there until I can recognize that the anxiety is starting to come down. And I call this the anxiety arc, where we come over that top, the top of the peak of the arc and it starts to get better again and just practice that. So we started there and, and that's what, really gave me some sort of power over OCD saying, hang on a second, I don't need to check so quickly. Then the next aspect of that was, and that, that was fortunate because the car was parked on a, on a flat car park. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to yeah. worry about it rolling down, but it's the same. It still invoked a lot of anxiety because I've been doing this for so long, but a lot of my checking behaviors happen at nighttime when I'm about to go to bed. And so the psychologist obviously can't be in my house when I do this. And so what we started to do is, for, for a lot of people that live with OCD, you have to do things in a certain order, for, for example. And, and that's particularly the case for me is I had to check the front door first and the side door, then the windows and, and go around in a bit of a loop like a racetrack. And so what we started to do is, is one of the, the techniques was naming it as I'm doing it. So you're actually verbalizing it and say, Simon, I'm checking the front door. And so it gets out of my head, which often goes around on a loop and a loop and a loop and it vocalizes it, which disempowers it from your head. The next aspect of it was to change the cycle. So instead of going, you know, checking one, two, three, four, five in that order to mix the order up. So again, it's telling my brain that I'm the one who's in control. I'm going to check it on my terms, not my brain's terms. And then if I'm feeling good one night, it might be actually skipping one of the, the windows, for example. And over time, if I'm feeling well, then I'm able to do this quite easily. If I'm stressed, anxious, if something bad's happening, then it peaks up again as well. So knowing that it's a bit of a roller coaster ride for me as well, gives me that comfort knowing, okay, yep, tonight's not a great night, but tomorrow's going to be a better day as well. And we can do this and do this and do this and keep going at it because we're going to start taking control over the brain as well. So that's, that's how ERP has helped. Um, and yeah, it, it, it 
came from a social media, finding some social media groups and, and, and platforms on Instagram and learning about OCD as opposed to just focusing on depression, which a lot of men's mental health stuff just focuses on depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you have it that these are different conditions, that depression and anxiety and OCD are actually three distinct conditions. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and mm -hmm. the depression and I mean, OCD used to be under the, uh, the anxiety umbrella, if you're looking at DSM-5 criteria, but now they've recognized that it is such a powerful and debilitating condition that it deserves its own recognition as a standalone disorder. Um, so yeah, certainly it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, OCD and anxiety are very anxiety driven in themselves and it creates a lot of anxiety, but there are definitely different traits to them that I experience too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do you apply now that you have this uh, knowledge and now that you've been treated, it sounds like at least significantly or, or effectively in the last few years, how is that experience interface with the men who uh, seek assistance for, with you in the last 12 months since you created the mindful man? Yeah. So I'm a big believer of knowledge is power. And I heard this really cool quote recently that says, if we can name it, we can tame it. And a lot of people say, you know, in, in the mental health space or disability space, which I work in as well, is that my condition doesn't define who I am, but I like to think that it's part of my definition as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, me accepting, hey, yeah, I live with OCD or I live with depression, I live with anxiety, I've experienced burnout as well. It's, it's me being able to name it, which disempowers it out of my head. And then from there, we can do the research, we can do the therapy that is tailored towards that particular condition. And so... For me, knowledge is power, and that's the first step. Acceptance that something's going on and you need to deal with it in some sort of way. And then it's recognizing, okay, how are we showing up? Am I drinking too much? For the guys that I work with, are they taking too much drugs? Are they? Is there any sort of addictive behavior that they're doing to mask or to, to suppress what's going on? And so the guys that come to me, we talk about this pretty openly. It's not like the traditional therapy where you go in a room you might lie on a couch you know the stereotypical type that you see on the tv and tell and you know just cry and cry and cry it's actually more of a workshop but we, we do it as a collaboration and and sometimes where i can and i can do it with meaning and purpose is share some of that lived experience as well for me and because and, they often say simon do you know what it's like to be, to be depressed and i'm like well actually i do and I'm mm -hmm. not going to hide from that. I'm not a therapist who's going to say, you know, I'm squeaky clean because that, that defeats the purpose. That, that doesn't let me live authentically. That actually puts a mask back on. But at the yeah. same time, you know, these sessions are for the guys that I work with. So I'm very selective with, with how I introduce my lived experience and say, okay, well, if you're experiencing depression, what some strategies that you can think of and I can show you what I've done and we can kind of workshop it together and work out what's best for you. And so sometimes yeah. that different perspective from a shared lived experience is very useful, but also through mindful men, most of the, the referrals that I get are for people looking for out the box therapy. They're not looking for a traditional therapist. They don't want to go on a clinic because there's a whole lot of, lot of stigma and shame around that going into a mental health clinic and so what I offer in my therapy is a therapy practice that's based out in community. So where I live, we have got some of the most amazing you know, nature around us. We've got the beach, which is amazing surf. We've got hinterland, which can go through forest walks. We've got, you know, if another half an hour out west and you're in, the, you're in rural Australia. And so we do a lot of walking and talking outside. Or we might go to, get, go to a cafe, grab a coffee. Or we might go, go for a drive if they're not up for getting out in community. We just go for a drive and, and we just talk as we drive. And so this helps guys to start to open up because it feels a little bit more natural than them going into a clinic where there's a whole bunch of shame and stigma, particularly around men. And it just helps them open up. And, and, it, and this is what I love about it as well is because I prefer doing that too. I don't want to sit in a clinic all day. I've got a clinic space or I've got telehealth, but... I actually prefer helping guys get out in community as well because loneliness is a huge thing. And so if we can inadvertently walk around community and, and help them connect with someone that, you know, might just be on the same beach with a hello as we walk past them. Right. We can, we can also help them feel more connected because when we live with a mental health mask on, we often feel like we're the only person in the world experiencing those issues like I did for 20 years.
Right. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I know that you're, you're buzzing up against as you speak about it, and, um, you know, I'm, I guess it's probably deliberate, is this idea that at the center of all healing is human connection. And this idea that you connecting with your clients or your clients connecting with other people or your clients connecting with you or with their family or friends is really where the healing emanates from. Is there something you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it starts with yourself. It has to start with you going, you know what, enough's enough. I've got to go get help. It's connecting with yourself. And that's what I did you know, in 2012, my wife, my now wife, you know, really encouraged me to go get help because she knew I could be better than how I was showing up at the time. And for me, that was that, that light bulb moment inside saying, you know what, she's right. I've been deflecting this for so long. I need to start asking for help and talking. And this is where guys struggle the most. It's just opening up for that first time. And, and I'm going to admit the first few times I went to a therapist, I felt like it was boring it was homework i've tried different therapists try to find the right fit nothing worked i dropped in and out of therapy for many years until i find that right connection with a therapist and the right gp as well my right doctor to talk about these things someone who's interested in men's mental health for example or ocd specifically and so that connection starts with the self and then from there you can start showing up a bit better with the people around you so it's maybe it's your, your wife and kids or your partner or your mates as well. You can actually maybe get together with mates and actually go past the superficial discussions like, oh, how's the, the footy on the weekend or how's the basketball or what's going on with this rock band or whatever and actually going, you know, guys, how are we going? Are we all right? Right. And that's really important. It is really important and brilliant. Really great that you're doing that. I'm really, really, really happy for you and happy for your friends. And I really get, again, at the core of this, it's very important to find your own genuine, honest, true authenticity that you have that by taking off the mask, you get need to be you need to resonate with yourself first. And once you do that, you have an opportunity to resonate with the people in your world, whether they be clients or patients or friends or family or loved ones or, you know, even just neighbors or clerks at the store. It's really important to get aligned with yourself is what I'm hearing you say and be honest about your own circumstances, your own conditions, your own trials and tribulations. Is that about right? Yeah, that's that's perfectly said because if we can't do that, then how are we going to do it to a therapist or mm -hmm. a partner or a child, like our, our, our children or our parents? Like how do we do that without continually to bottle things up? And this is particularly important for guys and I'm going to rattle off a statistic here. It's in Australia particularly, we have nine deaths by suicide every day and seven of those are males every mm. single day. Mm. And I, I think a lot of this stems from this inability. And I talked right off the, the top of the show around those 80s and 90s, for example, for me, it was around the suck it up mentality. It's around push through, don't, don't show weakness. And so the only outlet for some of these guys and for seven a day is, is to die. But if they just took that part out and go, you know what? I'm just going to get vulnerable and say, Hey, I need help. Like I feel so much better every single time I go see a therapist. And even when I walk out with some of the clients that I've worked with, they keep coming back because they get so much benefit out of it. I've, I've got one client who every time I go, I, I think as a therapist, I'm sometimes I'm like, I hope I'm doing all right by this client. But then the next time I see them, they're like, Oh yeah, Simon, every time we see you, we're just happier afterwards because we get to talk. Or we get to hang out with you and and just do stuff and and that's that's amazing. So if we can get more guys doing that, starting with the self and just letting their guard down, healing is so much easier that way as opposed to when they're pushed into therapy, which I've had those experiences as well, and they're not ready to talk. Then, but well, they they don't know how to talk, and so um, yeah, it's really about starting with the self um, as to get to get healing and and to get healthy again. Right. Exactly. Like getting involved with your core, like doing the shadow work, doing the difficult work and getting right down to what's so about you. Absolutely. And I, I went to a men's retreat for the first time a couple of weeks ago. And, and it was really interesting because I didn't know what to expect. But we had 30 blokes together for 12 hours. And we went and did that shadow work. And we and we were vulnerable in front of complete strangers we let our guards down and everybody walked away from that day just feeling so refreshed, like they were able to share stuff that they haven't shared with anybody before 
or maybe they select few and do it in a safe way that that builds that connection, that community as well. And some of those people still get together today and it's really a cool way to do it as well for guys not looking for a therapy approach. There are different things that you can do to start this work. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's great that you did that. And I, I really appreciate getting along with men. Now you choose men. What is it about men that makes men different than women in with respect to what, who you could help theoretically with obsessive compulsive disorder or with depression or anxiety or just getting through on life? Why yeah, men? I think, I, think I've, I choose men because it's what I know. Like I know from my own journey how hard it was to talk and, and I know what it feels like to just drink to suppress things, for example. A lot of guys in Australia, we drink. We have a big drinking culture here and we do it to suppress anger or sadness or emotions or whatever it is. So I, I get that and I get what it was like to go through 20 years and not being able to talk to somebody and not to have that male role model. Like I had a dad, my dad's around, but he's, he's one of those traditional guys that don't talk about anything. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've, I guess I'm doing this work to be that person for myself as a, as a lived experience therapist, but also the clients that I work with to be that positive role model that can just share what's going on and, and be okay with not being okay. So that's really important for me as well. But also for men, you know, like there's not many, and particularly in Australia, dedicated men's services that aren't reflective of something pretty bad like family domestic violence. So we've got a family and domestic violence issue over here where 90% of victims report males being the perpetrators of family domestic violence. And so the, the dedicated services are tailored towards being perpetrators or being, you know, not not capable dads or partners or men that have got substance abuse and alcohol abuse issues. And so this brings a whole bunch of shame and stigma again. So from a mindfulness based approach, what I want to do is help guys just tune into their authentic self in a, in a softer way, in a more gentler way that looks at things like values. It looks at things like goal setting in the future. It looks at how we're showing up today and what we can do to show up better tomorrow. Just 1%. That's all we're looking at. And, and, and the guys that come on board and, and they once they discover that this is not, you know, them sitting on a couch in a clinical, traditional clinical space, they're like, oh, this is actually pretty easy. I can do this and we can do this regularly and it feels good. And I don't have to resort to drugs and alcohol to suppress anything or I don't have to get angry because I've got an outlet here that's safe and is just for me, just as a man. And I'm there's no shame and stigma associated with it. It, it. When you see us doing our therapy sessions, it looks like two blokes walking on the beach or shooting hoops or playing video games or just driving around. And, and most people think, oh, okay, that's just two just guys hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. It's really great. I love what you're doing, Simon. I really appreciate it. It's such a unique and um, it's a heartwarming and refreshing way to take on these conditions and to bring it right from your soul, right from your core and to actually be who you are. Simon, if people wanted to get a hold of you from around the world and maybe learn from you or actually follow you, what would they do? How would they find you? Yeah, the best way is just on my website. So it's www.mindful-men.com.au. And that links to my therapy if you're in Australia or my social media as well. I do a lot of podcasts if anyone wants to hear me on the podcast. I've also yeah. got my own podcast, the Mindful Men podcast, where I share stories just like this from people around the world with the aim that it inspires someone else to listen to it and go, you know what, if Simon and, and Dr. Fred are talking about this, maybe I can talk about it as well. And so that's, I'm really yeah. passionate about that space as well. But the website's the best place to, to find all those resources. That's fantastic. Really great. I love that. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you so much for doing it. And the opportunity arises now for us to um, really just check in with each other. Like, how are you feeling at the end of this conversation? I absolutely love it. And and Dr. Fred, thanks so much for having this and holding this space for me. This, I often talk about guys holding space for each other to talk about mental health. Um, yeah. So I've really enjoyed our conversation and connecting with you. And I, I love the work that you're doing as well, promoting healthy healers as well. I think healthy healers for me is someone who embraces the lived experience as well, doesn't hide from it and lives that authentic self. So thank you so exactly. much for your work too. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you for understanding and thank you for appreciating. It's been a pleasure having you on the show and I wish you the very best. Is there anything you want to leave before leaving anything you want to leave with our listeners? So maybe one last tip or one last thing that you, if you had to scream it from the mountaintops, what would you tell our listeners? Oh, uh, th this one quote always comes to mind. I always say is nothing changes if nothing changes. There you go. 
So if you are sitting there today listening to this and going, you know what, I've been doing this for a long time or I'm sick of doing this, but I'm going to, you know, the only way to change that is to take a leap of faith and talk to someone, whether it's your yeah. partner, your friend, your doctor. Doctors are great because they're impartial and they can actually connect you in with mental health professionals, disability professionals, anything like that. And I think, you know, just get just get vulnerable. It's okay. It's going to be okay. All right. Beautiful. That's a great job and a great entry. And I totally appreciate it. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for being on the Healthy Healer. Simon Rennie from Australia. And um, uh, wasn't that a great conversation? We will catch you all on the flip side. Thank you for being with the Healthy Healer uh, as a listener. And it sure is a pleasure to introduce to you all these great people from around the world who have become healthy healers so they too can heal the world. Thanks again, Dr. Fred, signing off for now. We will catch you on the flip side. Bye for now. Bye, Simon.